today will be include some time for questions. <laughs> because some, several of you have asked for that. Um, what I want, what I would like to do today is to finish up our discussion of uh, aseptic bottling, and that will look, include a few remarks on aseptic bottling itself, and then to show about methods for detection, because we need to know that for this afternoon's um, demonstrations. Then, at that time, um, we can, uh, I think it'll be a good stopping place, we can uh, stop and uh, discuss different questions that you may have pertinent to what's going on this week. Uh, in addition to that, I thought that next Tuesday, in, we left the lab period open, and what we have done in the past for that often is to demonstrate the enzymatic methods for determining lactic or malic acids. And it turns out almost all of you knew that and done it many times, and it was kind of a bore for everybody. So instead of doing that, I think what we'll do is have a discussion, break down into our lab periods, but dis just have it open for discussion for things that you want to talk about, either which we have covered in the course, uh, not enough detail or in a confusing way, or that uh, you want to, uh, dis that would be supplementary to the course. So try to think of questions. And we'll have time this afternoon for questions that are pertinent to lab reports and that sort of thing. But I mean more, more questions uh, germane to the course in general for next um, Tuesday's discussion. We can discuss the enzymatic method too, but I don't think we'll have the demonstration. Oh, well, before I forget it then, uh, there's, there will be be the demonstrations this afternoon or, and this evening during the regular lab period at 2, 3, and 4 o'clock and at 7, 8, and 9 o'clock. The lab will be open. You can do your bacterial identification, finish it up if you need to, but the demonstrations will be upstairs. Uh, I don't know how we're going to get that door open, but I'll come down and get you, I guess, for tonight. That's always a problem. And then Thursday, the, we'll be doing a tasting. I uh, hope we can talk about that too this afternoon, about the end product analysis as far as we've gotten. Uh, the tasting at, in your, in your uh, lab sections at 1 o'clock for the afternoon group and at 6 for the evening group. Remember we said because of the, uh, the uh, wingding for uh, Professor Amory, we're going to move that up a little bit. Okay. Uh, now back to where we were left off last time about the methods for stabilizing wine not using chemical additions. There's a couple things, pretty three things I didn't make clear. One is that we're, we're talking now about only about semi-dry wine, wines that have some sugar in it. Now there's no point in doing this, going to all this uh, 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 extra work for dry wines because the only yeast that would grow in there would be spoilage yeast and that's not what we, we don't expect to have any of those. So we don't need it for that. Although if we were having a situation where we had spoiled yeast, it was nice to have this technique on the books so we could get rid of the yeast. Um, another thing, I, I, the slide showed a very large operation, uh, automatic line, uh, bottling line. Then we showed a, a semi-automatic or a hand bottling uh, line. But I want to make it clear that this type of uh, procedure is applicable to all sizes of wineries, even completely hand-filled. There are uh, available filters that have the filling uh, head right on the filter filter uh, apparatus itself. The hand operated one or two bottles at a time where you can uh, filter directly the uh, sterile wine into bottles that have been sterilized by some method, say one of those other machines we have. There's even, there are, that we saw, there are even smaller machines. So this is applicable at all levels and at all levels people are using them mostly in Europe, but also in California to a limited extent. I think I also should say a little bit about the, the at least the German method of making semi-dry wines, because I kind of assumed that you knew this, but uh, perhaps it's new information to you. In this case, the wines are fermented dry and then are sweetened afterwards. This may come as a surprise to you. Indeed, it came as a surprise to me when I went on my sabbatical leave to Germany. There are two things I went to find out about. One was um, pressure fermentation, because this was the method of making uh, semi-dry wines. You could, um, under, pressure, under pressure, you could allow the fermentation to, in a pressure tank, you'd allow the fermentation to build up to a certain pressure, then slow it down. The yeast would settle down, let the pressure off, let them build up again, taking nutrients out again, much like we talked about cold uh, uh, stabilization of uh, microbiological biological stabilization. So you could do this three or four times, and you would end up then with wines, which all the nutrients were gone, with uh, whatever sugar you wanted. 
The big problem with this was that it was just a pain in the neck to run. It was very difficult to get it to go the way you wanted it to. Eric? Right. Now you're saying during method was to ferment once dry and then sweeten it once. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got to interrupt myself. The, let me say what I thought the method was. Well, the old method was to use this pressure fermentation where you'd end up with a, with a, a semi-dry wine. But they stopped doing this because it was too difficult to control. And they went to another method. They went to a method of fermenting to dryness and then sweetening, sweetening with what they call the sweet reserve, which is grape juice itself, not usually concentrate, usually grape juice, which is kept from fermenting by several means, often by, uh, by uh, pressure itself, or by just uh, a good uh, tight filtration, more or less sterile conditions, and kept in the cold, made with extra SO2 added. By law, the German wines have to be have to be fermented to a certain the grape juice, the sweet reserve has to be fermented to a certain amount, uh, practically the amount that will make enough pressure to inhibit fermentation, so that they have two or three percent alcohol plus the plus the pressure CO2 pressure makes them pretty stable. I'm not sure, in fact, if all people are doing this. I don't know what the the law. There's new laws. And the new laws have been changed again, and how much they're being enforced on some of these things, I'm not sure. You do know that the sweet reserve has to be the same, according to the law, the same grape juice that the wine was fermented from. So what happens is be just before bottling, say a, month, a week before bottling, sweet reserve is added to the dry wine to the level that they think is pleasant. That'll give you a good balance, hopefully, between sugar and um, acid. Now this wine is unstable because you've added sugar, you've added grape sugar, you've added grape juice. So then you have to do something, and what they, what we're talking about now is filtration to get rid of the yeast. Now this, of course, isn't true with the Sauterne type wines or the uh, Trocken Berenauslaces or the Berenauslaces, where these wines have been have fermented as far as they can go because of the high sugar to begin with. They are naturally sweet, and you you don't have to worry about yeast in these wines. Wines? Pardon me? Jelly wines. No, I mean, no. Um, I mean, just higher alcohol, high enough alcohol that prevents further fermentation. Deli wines would be ones that would have, that, well, they could be anything, but they'd be ones that would have low amounts of alcohol, so much so low that you would think that they would ferment, but the sugar is high enough so they wouldn't ferment. No, these, uh, these, these uh, specially picked German wines and sauternes aren't that high in sugar usually. So they, they wouldn't want that, like, uh, high tolerance ethanol producing yeast for uh, Probably not, yeah. They probably want, uh, they want to use, use a normal yeast, but in, in, in all, again, in all these cases, or in almost all these cases, they're using a spontaneous fermentation. They're not really worrying about what the yeast is. So it made it clear that um, how these wines are made, and what was the other point? Oh, I know what it was. Oh, they have to add from their own, from that same juice, supposedly. If it's an ounce lazy, they have to add the sweet reserve has to be an ounce lazy. Now, the qualitates wine, mid, pretty, yeah, that's right, that's right. But in general, in generally, these wines are sweet. Well, the ounce lazy could have sugar addition, but generally they're sweet that they don't need any, like the barren ounce lazy and the trocken barren ounce lazy. You don't need any uh, sugar addition. But it is true for the others, and yeah. cabinet and ounce lazy. And, and spate lazy. They have to be from the juice. It's a law now. I'm not saying how much that's enforced, but uh, I think people try. Okay. Then, of course, when you've added the sweet reserve back to the wine, you're developing an instability, not only a microbiological instability, but a question of tartrate stability and protein stability. That's why this, what they call this marrying process, you don't do it just before filtration, before uh, bottling. And you have to watch the wines pretty carefully for that time to make sure they don't start fermenting in the holding tank. Well, any questions in general on, uh, on the cold sterile bottling, except for the detection system, which we're going to talk about now? Go ahead, John. Oh, I'm why the are, are there? Oh, that's the, the limit of alcohol. There's so much sugar to begin with. Yes, that there's not enough deli in it No, but if it's over 14% alcohol, wines, I mean, that's usually about the limit of alcoholic fermentation, whatever the sugar is. Right? Uh, yeah. 
they also think that the Botrytis produces a, uh, a toxin that is dangerous to yeast. There is, that is true. That uh, there is an, at least an anti. There's an enzyme inhibitor produced by by Botrytis. It's worked on a, um, at Western Regional. I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that. Didn't they originally think that Botrytis uh, developed an antibiotic to an, uh, Botrytis or something? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, but, yeah. but there is a there is an enzyme inhibitor in it that uh, an anti Browning anti Browning factor. No, okay. Let's get your comment on filtration and quality. Or well, which is better? I mean. You know, everyone's saying it really wipes out the, the aroma and everything so much. Uh, I don't know that there's any da good data to indicate that. It needs to be done. It really needs to be done. I, I'm i sure there's, uh, people can tell the difference between just a very uh, normal filtration and no filtration at all. But when you get down to these levels where you're talking about uh, EK filtration or uh, or less than that, uh, 0.8 uh, microns, I don't think there's some, there's no data. There isn't any data. I know that. Yeah. Are you talk about champagne now or later? Later. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the detection methods that you can use. See, you you've got this very um, um, what's the word uh, uh, frightening situation in a way. You're you've filtered the wine and you're running it through sterile, hopefully sterile equipment, into sterile bottles using sterile corks and sterile methods. But still, you don't know just by looking at the wine that minute whether everything has worked out all right or not. There's no real safety factor. And so you need some way to detect very, hopefully quickly, uh, that you can, uh, th if there's been any error in the uh, method. And the method that's being used generally now is to Filter, take, bo take bottles off the line various times, random through the day, especially at the beginning of the run, at the end of the run, but other times too. Filter them through a sterile setup that has a, a membrane of usually they use 0.45 uh, membrane. Filter this by vacuum, the whole bottle through. Then incubate this membrane and wait for a couple of days to see if any colonies developed. And if colonies developed, that means there was some viable yeast in there, or else you were awfully sloppy in your uh, technique, one or the other. Uh, and it turns out that if things are going right, there, there generally are no colonies. There may be, at the most, one or two. And according to a recent thesis from Oxford, you could tolerate five viable yeast. Remember, the situation on the, on, the, on the membrane is going to be far more conducive to growth than that in the bottle. You don't have SO2. You don't have um, low pH. You don't have... Um, um, you have nutrients, and you don't have high, high, concentration of high concentration of alcohol. So you're really, really very conducive to get anything that's growing there to grow. How accurate is that? Five. Oh, um, that was considered a, a, a maximum. If you got more than that, your, your chances of, of instability were, were enough that you would worry about it. Again, you can't talk. It's just like canning peaches and worrying about clostridium. You have to talk about uh, uh, statistics and... Uh, um, probabilities. Okay, the other method, and one we're going to, we'll see both of these this afternoon. The other method is to, instead of waiting for the colonies to grow, is to try to look at the look at individual cells right away. In this case, you filter through your bottle the same way, and you're going to put the membrane then under the microscope and scan it for any colony, or for any cells, I should say. Now, this is going to be difficult if you're going to have a 47 millimeter mem diameter membrane. That's going to take you most of the afternoon and part of the next day to scan that whole thing. Of course, there were lots of yeast on there. You wouldn't have to scan very much. You could scan one, one square, perhaps, on a gridded membrane. But if there weren't very many, as you hope there wouldn't be, if you're looking for less than five, it means you've got to scan this whole thing and it would be very tedious. So Millipore came out with a method that makes this much easier by taking a 13 millimeter membrane instead of a 47 millimeter membrane. That's the diameter I'm talking about. So this now can be scanned much, much uh, more quickly. It's much smaller in diameter. Now their method then was to take the, the membrane with the yeast or without the yeast on it and set it on a pad of Ponso S stain. Let me write that down. I was looking up, I wasn't looking for the spelling, I was looking for the amount, but it's nice to know the spelling too. It's the, the stain was 0.9 grams Ponso S, 13.4 grams trichloroacetic acid,
and 13.4 grams sulfosalicylic acid. This is in the uh, way it's made up. They made it up in 100 grams of water. Now, if you put this membrane then on, on a pad soaked with this, protein stains very, very brilliant red. I mean, this is a histological stain is where they got the idea. Now, you can take the membrane then and place it again on a dilute solution of acetic acid. You can, so to speak, wash away the, the red color that doesn't stain. And you end up with a brilliant white background of the, of the uh, membrane with the brilliantly red stained cells, yeast cells on top. Now you put this under the microscope, and instead of using, incident, using light from underneath because it's opaque, you bring in light from the side. Now there are ways of clearing uh, millipore mem or membranes, or the nucleopore has a, has a kit and a procedure where you use light from underneath. The nuclear, more, nuclear pore membrane can be rendered transparent, and so can the uh, millipore membrane be rendered transparent. But in this case, we don't do it that way. The incident light comes in from the side. Now, the problem here, you want, you want to have enough magnification so that you can see the cells, and you want to have um, low enough magnification so you have a large uh, field, so you don't have to scan so much. And they've come up with a compromise. You need about 400 power magnification to resolve yeast cells. So instead of ordinarily, you'd use a 10 power objective and a, 40, a 10 power eyepiece and a 40 power objective. But if you do that, then you, this is very close, the objective to the, to the uh, specimen, and you can't get any light in there. So another four people came up with the idea of using a 20 power um, objective and a 20 power eyepiece. That gives you 400. Now you have more space here, and the light can come in here and shine on that, that red glob of, uh, of yeast there. Now you don't get the same resolution as you would with the four. You get the same magnification, but not the same resolution as you would with the 10 and the 40. But you don't need that. You're looking for these characteristic shaped yeast, and they're kind of a red glob on the white background with a little bit of a shadow. Yeah. How do you do this uh, washing with acetic acid? You just draw it through the. No, you set it on another pad. We'll do it. I'll show you the second how it's done. Yeah. We'll see these. Um, the only problem is this 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 uh, stain. The stain is for dead and live cells. So you're staining total yeast. You're not just staining viable yeast. And you can have a lot of dead yeast in there, especially if this is the beginning of a run of a of a. a bottling run that has been, the, all the equipment has been sterilized, you still, in the first half hour, you can get a lot of yeast into the bottles. They're dead yeast, but they're still yeast, and they would show up on this. So you needed a method for uh, detecting viable yeast. Does anybody have an idea, or does anybody know how Millipore solved the problem? How they, their selection, their idea was? No, no, that's, that's ours. <laughs> how, did, how did Millipore come up with an idea to handle this? Ingenious, but it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fluorescent stain. Remind me to mention that afterwards. Um, no, what they said was, let's incubate this before we stain it for a few hours. And if the cells divide uh, two, twice or three times, we'll have a mini colony. And now we can look and we can see if it's, if it's more than one cell, then it was a viable cell. That seems pretty nice, doesn't it? You have to do this after, you have to stain after you let it grow for a while. The only trouble is, and I think we can answer this, although not as we didn't demonstrate it as dramatically as we have in, in classes in the past sometimes, because it's kind of hard to show exactly. The problem, do you have any idea what the lag period is for this, from yeast coming out of wine? It's a long time. It's not two or three hours as if you took a yeast right out of a growing culture and transferred it into a nice medium. When you're taking yeast out of wine in, an, in a uh, static, uh, um, dormant situation and put them on, on this, it'll be about 24 hours before you get the first division. So you're really not much better off. And you have to worry about contamination during this time, too, of bacteria, which grow much, much faster, which might get on there. So you you're still have all your wine in your warehouse labeled and bottled, uh, corked, with its capsule on it and in its, uh, in its uh, cardboard containers before you get to know the answer. So this 
one day isn't that much of an improvement over the three days. It means you don't store the wine in the, in the uh, warehouse that long, but it still means you have, to, uh, un you have to uncork the wine if there's something wrong. So we came up with the idea, uh, another genius in the house, <laughs> of using uh, methylene blue. And this is, methylene blue has been used for this long, long time ago, and we used it in the lab too, didn't we? But it's not real exact, but it seems to work pretty good for this procedure. And what we do in this case then is put the, um, run the sample through the filter holder with a small membrane, and then add methylene blue, let that, um, sit there for about a half a minute and let, let it come through then. Put the vacuum on, let it come through. Don't wash. You wash, you wash the melatonin blue away. So then you take this membrane then and put it on the slide and look at it under the microscope the same way as this and count the dead yeast, right? You can't see the live yeast on there. They'll, they'll, if, you, if you know what you're looking for, you can, but it's not easy to count. So you count the dead yeast and then take the membrane off and run it through the methylene, the Ponzo S stain and put it back here and count the total. And subtract the total, the, de the, the blue ones from the red ones, and you have the living ones. Now you can see the, some pitfalls in this. As I said, if, they're, if this was at the beginning of the run and it was kind of a dirty operation, you would have lots of yeast in there that would be dead, and you'd be counting lots of dead yeast and lots of total yeast and trying to subtract these two numbers. So it's not applicable in that case. But generally speaking, once your run is going, everything is clean, you could just do the Ponzo S stain and, and see that there would be no yeast. And that would be easy enough. Then finally, if sometime something came along, you found that there was 30 or 40 Ponzo S yeast, red yeast, then you'd want to use the methylene blue. Start over again, do the methylene blue and see if, it, if these are mostly dead or mostly live. But again, if something's wrong, it's going to be really wrong. You're going to have lots and lots of live yeast there. So this, once you've gotten the hang of this, will be a good safety factor. You could just check um, every uh, half hour or it takes about a half hour to do the whole thing to see that everything is going right. Although you would have to be a little bit careful about the beginning of the fermentation, uh, pardon me, the beginning of the bottling. And if your corks are really bad, you had cheap corks that you're getting a lot of cork dust, they'll get on the, they'll get on the mem membrane and make it hard for you to count yeast. Yes? Yeah. Oh, now you're talking about the filtration of the wine itself, or are you talking about this part of it? It's not. Oh, that's the whole point to make sure that the to make sure everything is okay, to make sure your filtration is all right, to make sure your sterilization of the of everything in the line was okay. See, the procedure procedure is to to sterilize the wine let's say by filtration either membrane or by, um, by depth filter. Either one, you've got no yeast coming out of there. You hope you have no yeast. There could be a hole in the filter, there could have uh, uh, the, been a lot of back pressure or, or it could have been not set in properly. Now we mentioned the, the bubble test for the membrane filters, which is a big help, but still, you're still at that point, you only know that everything's good from up to coming out of the filter. Then from going into the filling machine, and in the corking machine, you know, into the bottles. Is everything all right there? Have you made some error there? It's just, it, if everything went right, you wouldn't have to worry about it. That's true. But the things that can go wrong are, okay, bad filtration, or um, not, not being careful enough in your sterilization of your, of your, of your uh, filler, or of getting a hold of some bad corks, some, um, non-sterile corks, or is having some wise guy come in and take a bottle off the line and handle it and put it back without realizing what he's doing and contaminate the whole thing that's going to happen. So this is a way of checking for it. Well, I think we'll show the slides of this procedure, then we can go on for questions. Let's see. I didn't give, oh, the methylene blue, I should tell you what that is. It's 0.01% methylene blue in Sorensen's. Uh, buffer pH 4.6. This is where we got it from. Huh. We got wine processing, so 0.1% methylene. Does that make any difference? Well, it's too, it's too high. <laughs> It'll kill you. From, from who did you get it from? Oh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. oh, did he? Yeah, oh, my fingers are dirty. Yeah. Um, well, it's again, it's like the, it's like the chromatography thing. We put a lot of different ideas together of other people's ideas. Came up with this that, that seems to work, but no credit for it. Okay. Uh, can we have? Um, can you uh, hit? You know how to handle that? You don't. Okay. Touch it. Touch it really lightly. No. <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe. Yeah. No. No. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, let maybe. Some, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll go back there. Barney, you're getting a free ride. You go back there. And come. Uh, maybe we better have the doors closed, huh? Uh, have you got the light on? I don't think you've got the switch all the way up. <laughs> Okay, this is um, set up here. You can sterilize. This is a filter, filter funnel with a vacuum, and you can sterilize this with several ways. One, you can autoclave it, but if you're doing a lot of these, another way is to use high proof or 70% uh, ethanol and or methanol and uh, dip it in there and flame it. Or some people just use uh, high proof or 70% high proof, let's say, and then wash with sterile water. So uh, next slide, uh, real tight. Huh? Yeah, you know, this you're not going to cut the wine. You don't care about oxidation. You're going to just, you're just going to get the yeast out of the wine. So here are some membranes. Uh, often it's good to use the black background membranes. The colonies show up a little bit better. And you can sterilize those again many ways, but one of the easiest ways is to just have it in, in uh, boiling water and at least 15 minutes, and you just keep it going all day long and just take out your sample, uh, you take out your membrane as you need it. Um, next, next one. The things that say the prepackaged sterile. Oh, you can use those too. Yeah, they're about twice the price. But uh, uh, yeah, those are fine to use. You have to remove them, remove them with sterile forceps, of course. Oh, no. Well, now maybe well, we haven't ordered any for a while, but they used to be a lot more expensive. That'd be interesting. It's true, yeah. Um, so that now the mem this has been flamed, and the membrane is being put onto the, uh, the um, holder. That's a 47 millimeter. This 47 millimeter membrane, yeah. Next slide. Uh, here, now, you have to be careful about opening the cork. You don't want to contaminate uh, the wine coming out. And so, one of the things you can do is stick the end of the bottle into alcohol and flame it, and then pull the cork out part way, and then stick in the bottle and flame it again, and then pull the cork all the way out. Um, next uh, slide. Now they're taking the cork all the way out and flame, flaming this rim, too. Okay, next slide. Doing really good, John. Uh, now, oh, that's a hand there, yeah. Pouring into the uh, funnel vacuum. This thing will hold, this particular one will hold about 500 milliliters. So you usually have to do it twice. Um, set this back down and put a little uh, sterile beaker over the top. Next slide. Yeah, you should give it a good, although it's just come off, usually it's come off the boiling line. You wouldn't really have to think of it in those terms, but it wouldn't hurt to shake it. Okay, now you take the membrane off, and there's a couple ways, a couple things you can do. You can incubate this onto a wet pad, sterile, made wet with a nutrient solution, or onto auger, just like our wort auger plates. Just put it on there. Next slide. I think that's all there. Okay, the next slides are the, are the tech, the, what the yeast look like under this situation. The next slide, I hope that's it. No, oh, keep going. Oh, yeah, here now, this is a lot of yeast, just to give an idea of what you're looking for. Um, John, can you focus that a little bit? I guess it's the best you can do, yeah. No, no it's the other thing, not that, the uh, knob there. Yeah, that's better. Now here is the grid, so you can see what that looks like. What we did, we took, put this under a certain point, took the picture, did the other stain, found that same grid again using one of these things as a, as a marker, that one up there, I think, thinking it was yeast, <laughs> it turned out not to be. Um, you can see the, on the grid, you can see the, the white, the live yeast. And I think you probably can see some here that, maybe one up there that's, uh, you couldn't count it, but it would be, uh, you could see, see that, that it's there. Now this is far too many to count. This is just to give you an idea of what you're looking for. If you had something like this, you would just throw up your hands, you know? <laughs> 
But, well, it does look like they're mostly all, mostly all dead, though. Uh, next slide. Because this is more realistic. Um, here was, uh, here's two with Ponce West training. There's the one with, uh, and right under it is the one you don't see. Now, there's the one you don't see. The one you see is the one you don't see. Um, you may say, gee, this is uh, kind of hard to see. And, it, you know, it does take a little bit of uh, technique. You have to have some familiarity with this. But I ask you to run a Wilmus press the first time. If you've never seen anybody do it, uh, you know, it would be kind of awesome to do something like that. But in five minutes, you got the hang of it. It's kind of the same thing with this. Um, next slide. Last one, I think. Oh, show you that some cases where you have really dirty wine. This is, I think I was going to tell you this funny about the, the the winery across the street from where we were doing this, we went over to get some of these, get some bottles because we want to try this. And so he says, well, what are you doing this for? And he says, well, we want to find out a way that you can see if the wine has been sterilely bottled without having to wait three days, a way that you can find out immediately instead of waiting three days. And he says, oh, our wine is all drunk in three days. And I believe it. It really was, uh, they weren't terribly careful. It was sterile, but it was dirty. The corks this is a lot of cork material, and unfortunately, it stains blue. So you get a lot of blue stuff, whereas the red is pretty specific for, for uh, well, it's specific for a protein, so you don't have too much interference with the red one. And as I say, I think your standard technique would be to use the red method, and then if something was going wrong, you ha happen to get a large amount number, then you'd want to do it again with the methylene blue. Okay, can we have the lights? So you think the red would be ideal? Well, the red would be your troubleshooting, and if everything worked okay, yeah, I've got over 10. Okay. Those, those used to stick on those membranes pretty well. I mean, it's hard to wash them off. Is that if you're well, they stick on, because well, you, you handle them. The question is, do, do the yeast stick onto the membranes? Because you take it out of the, take it out of the uh, filter holder and put it on the, the thing, and then usually cover it, then take it over to the microscope. I should say that with the Ponzo S one, you, you put it on the slide and you heat it to make the membrane flatten out and also to get rid of the, some of the acetic acid that's there. One of the problems with the dampness you can, and that's, that load, that diff, distance there, you get fogging of, the, out of the, um, uh, the lens every once in a while, and you either have to wipe it off or you can kind of blow against it and uh, defog it. With the, mem with the methylene blue one, of course, you can't heat it up because you kill the cells. And so they de we devised a, a plexiglass slide with a hole in it you can put right over the top of that to put it in place. Okay, let's uh, take some time for some questions if you have any. On, on, well, on, on this, on this procedure, or on uh, reports, or let's talk about the procedure for, for uh, which time do we have? Yeah, for five minutes, if you, if you have any questions. On the, not necessarily on this procedure, but on sterile bottling. Now, remember, we still haven't gone over much detail about, or won't, but we can a little bit, on chemical me methods of of microbiological, microbiological stability. That's not to emphasize my prejudice, but it's just that you have this information so often in other classes that we need to only go over some of the details, I think. On the light you use coming in from the yeah. side, do you just use the white light? Yeah, and this is a, that's a good point. The very best light is one of these surgeon's shot uh, lamps that it has it's, uh, glass fibers, and you can just manipulate it. It has a little lens. You can get it right down in there. We don't have that. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, what we have just, what I'm used to using is just a tensor lamp. And what we see this afternoon won't be as ideal as, as, as these pictures were taken, but it's surprisingly good. There's another microscope lamps that are available from microscope companies that aren't too expensive that work a little bit better than a tensor lamp. Was it the or something? Yeah, and you can kind of adjust where the uh, light goes. That, speaking of dissecting itself, if any of you have done dissecting, I think that's a good example of how you can get a skill within a half an hour. When you first do some dissecting, the, that forceps looks like a, like one of those big grids that they have that they're, uh, what do you call it, Gr uh, when you're building a, a building? Girders, yeah. You think, gosh, how can I move that around? And very shortly, you find that you've developed a good skill for that. Uh, question. Um, the, the most expensive thing, I think, is the filter holder a filter holder that'll hold a 13 millimeter membrane. And Zeitz makes one, 500 milliliters, and I think it's, uh, it's o over $100. Uh, and Latrig uh, packaging, I'm not making a pitch for anything, but they, are, they, they would be handling uh, Zeitz. No, Millipore doesn't, Millipore, the closest Millipore has is a silting index uh, deal, which is about this long and this big around, 
uh, with a 13 millimeter thing at the end, but that's about $400. Uh, how much, you have to apply a lot of vacuum, I imagine that. No, no, just, just house vacuum is fine. Yeah. Oh, you know, we used we used a water aspirator. Works fine. Uh, to finish the question, uh, you need some adapters for your microscope. You need the uh, the 20, p, 20 power eyepiece and 20 power oculars, but they're not very expensive. These are real cheap things. You know. Yeah, it's very. Okay. Uh, suppose you filter and you find these cells there. Yeah. What do you do? Oh, haha! You stop the line. <laughs> That's a good point. What if what if something has gone wrong? Well, then you just have to troubleshoot, and you. You're going to have to um, stop the stop the line, and you're going to have to take samples. You'll be the microbiologist. Take you have equipment ready for that. Take samples everywhere along the line to see where the contamination could be coming from. If there's something wrong with the filter, if there was bad sterilization of the of the bottle filler, if the sterilize bottle sterilizing wasn't working right, or if you weren't bothering to sterilize the bottles, that'd be probably be the first place to look. Um, or if there's something wrong with the corks. Would you want to check in front of that too to make sure something you might have missed? I mean, maybe. Okay, well, you see your test shows all of a sudden an hour into your drive, yeah. you see, all right, all of a sudden all these yeast cells yeah. will right take a few, stop, and check the samples that already went out or the first few that were bought. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to cry wolf, wolf. That's right. I mean, if you made the mistake, you mean? No. Oh. I mean, say you, you identify that there are. 50 yeast per yeah. bottle. Okay, you're going to say stop it from now on. Yeah. What about what's already gone through? Would you want to go back and run a few samples on what's gone through to make sure they were stable? Or well, I think you would figure those would have to be unbottled. Yeah. But you might as well test yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, test a few of them. Yeah. Your membrane broke or something. Yeah. They're all going to be bad. Yeah. Not all of them. That's true. Somewhere along the line. Yes. Yeah. I think this is a good point. What you're going to do in a situation like that. It seems to me that uh, Either one of them, re-sterilize everything, empty the filler out, re-sterilize everything, rather go through the check and try and pinpoint where it's coming from. Yeah, I, I think that's true, too, uh, that it, why not just start over, yeah, and uh, re-sterilize everything. The other thing is But you could do both. You could check. Excuse me. You could, you're not going to know the answer to this to this uh, troubleshooting right away. It's going to take three days. But you can go through and make make this uh, make these trials, which only take five minutes. Then then re-sterilize everything. You know, um, the thing is, I just don't know any place any time this happens. Though, I mean, you can get. But this isn't a, this isn't a thing that you would expect to happen. I mean, something could happen to the filter. You get a big blow there. But and that's that's the first place you'd look. I think. As far as California, my feeling is that so far nobody that I've heard of has invested the money to go to the sterile. There are several wineries doing it with great, with huge success. One, uh, one of them is one of the well. I don't think it's uh, any secrets which ones they are, but uh, it's medium sized and medium large and small. The last count, there's seven. I know that I've been doing it now for quite a while, successfully, without really going to all the going to all of the uh, precautions that I've mentioned. Oh, I see. And they're still doing it correctly. Yeah. Huh? No, I mean that they might they might not be using uh, uh, they might be using uh, sterilizing their own corks or uh, something like that or not not invest in a brand new uh, bottling machine. Any other questions? We can start talking about some other things. What's an effective way of sterilizing cork without destroying the inside of it? Well, I mentioned that last time with the SO2 and the, and the parafilm, yeah. Paraffin, yeah. Um, uh, what would you consider a, a reliable sample percentage-wise so when you're taking sampling um, the bottling? Yeah. Uh, for, statistically, I don't know. But what they do do, do do, is a, with this other procedure is about every half hour take take one. No, that's not true. I know places they only take, they've got it down so they take about three at the beginning and three at the end. And then may not even do those that day. They might do them in, in a day or two later and do them all at once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What does commercial equipment look like? Is it like the slides? Commercial equipment. Uh, for the what? Oh. Yeah, we just see them on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. What about filtering rate? Is it slow? Well, 
we, maybe we should get into it, talk about filtering a little bit. Yeah, that depends on the uh, pore size and, and how clean the wine is to begin with. And this is a, this is a problem. Um, a lot of people would want to go to 0.45 micron filtration to get rid of bacteria that are making these nouveau, the uh, Beaujolais type wines to prevent malolactic fermentation. And at the, generally speaking, the flow rate is, the, the silting is so bad that it, uh, or I'd always thought that at least, was, that it was so impractical that you have to change the filters all the time. But in fact, some people are doing it. Now uh, there again, I don't know what the taste, uh, the tasting data indicates between uh, 1.1 and 0.45. If any of you have any answers to some of this, then no. The standard what, point, well, there's three, three main ones. Perhaps we should have a lecture on filtration. Hmm? Uh, 1.2, I should say, will get out yeast. 0.45, We'll get out everything except maybe some phage, bacteria too. But 0.65, we'll get out most, we'll get out all yeast, of course, it's smaller than this. We'll get out most bacteria because even though bacteria are smaller than that, they're generally in, uh, or the, the diameter is smaller, they're generally in chains. So, and any filtration is going to get rid of most things, you know, even if the whole, whole, uh, whole size is larger. So a lot of people are hoping to get rid of 99.99% of the bacteria this way and hope what gets through is um, not viable enough or not vital enough in wine to carry out, uh, to grow enough to cause a malolactic fermentation. Oh, most people, for, for, for yeast. Yeah, almost everybody is. It's very, very few people are using this, but some people are using these now. Is there a difference in Oh, yeah. This, it can be many fold time difference. That's one of the big problems. And that's why this is, this is so much better than this one that we used to say you couldn't get by with this and you'd have to be changing the filters all the time. But by using really tight filtrations and brilliant filtering, pre filtering, people are getting by with this. Yeah. Thank yeah, go ahead, Jay. the size of the pore size remove the whole organ? <laughs> no, uh, uh, but no, there is something called grow through. I think we better have uh, some time on, on filtration. Uh, we'll, we'll spend some time on that uh, next week then. I think some people had some questions though about what's due and what's not due. Yeah. Can we talk about that sort of thing right now? Just starting out with the handbook. Yeah. Really well, first of all, okay, but let me talk about the thing, what I handed out. This is supposed to be a guide for you for Tuesday for our tasting. Unfortunately, some of the data is not there, or especially some of the uh, duplicate data isn't there, uh, aren't there. I hope that we can get the rest of the information in and um, we can uh, supplement this data uh, for Thursday. But you might just look at, uh, so there are some very significant differences, and I think that's something that you want to think about. Okay, uh, about the handbook. The handbook would be the same as the wine yeast strain uh, write-up that's also due uh, soon, or next week. Is that something that, a momento, something that you will have in two or three years from now, or four or five years from now, when it comes to time that you may want to isolate an organism or identify it, or you may want to know something about differences in yeast strains and how you might measure them. And instead of having to um, drive back over to Davis, you just look in that book and it's all there. Yeah. What you just want is a flowchart. Well, it can be, it can be, at minimum, the information, the handouts, etc., plus and plus a plus a table of contacts, contents, or an index would be enough, and maybe uh, including your own write-ups of uh, uh, that might have gone a little more detail. But if you want to, you can make this a real big thing. As a matter of fact, this could be your extra project by expanding it and making it more personal and more more informative. Yeah. Is it for just yeast? No, bacteria. Yeast and bacteria. So, and when you say handouts, you mean the labs? Yeah. Well, yeah. anything on those. So that's a lot of our, our all of our labs basically, right? Yeah. So we're gonna put all we're gonna bind all this, we're gonna give it to you. Yeah. How are we gonna study the final? Oh well you'll have a back for that. Back yeah. Back oh yeah. Monday or something? Yeah. Yeah. Monday. Tuesday anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> you want all the labs, all the results and pertinent stuff out of our language. I want it, I would like it in a way that you think that it would be helpful to you. If you just throw the stuff in there in no order, that's not going to be very good. Although, you probably, you get it, you'd, 
you get by on it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Listen, I want I want uh, to say this come from this has come from experience that you may think, well, I'll never use it, but it it happens, and many not not just a few, many people have really thought this was an important part of the course to have this later on. Hmm? Lecture this stuff about isolating your Yeah, well, the the lab and the lecture handouts. Uh, both have information. Do you understand? You know what yeah, I'm saying? See, in other words, you, well, you, you want to be, able to, uh, to be able to make up the media, for example. So if you don't have that in there, that's not going to be helpful. That's You're going to... That's all in the various yeah. types of in, media and stuff. Right, yeah. yeah. And what to use all media for? I'm just worried about how much that election you know what it's on. Yeah. I know, you know, you don't want to... You know, we could find just the... I meant, uh, not, there are lecture handouts yeah. that had oh, some yeah, information on it, too. Yeah. SL Media, you mentioned. Thank <laughs> you.